into a human I can depend on to bring me happy. Welcome to A Captain's Log, the exclusive new Star Trek talk show set to bring you through a long and prosperous trek among the stars. Guest stars, that is. It's time to transmit episode 6 to you from space. Then, on to subspace communication, where David Zapone will be our very special interview guest. You might remember that he produced What We Left Behind, the Star Trek Deep Space Nine superb 2018 documentary. Raj is just frying his circuits to tell us more. Go ahead, Raj. Bass, David Zapone is one of the most successful Star Trek documentary producers ever. That's a fact, not an opinion. But I'm sure you'll talk business as usual with him, going over his multiple record-breaking crowdfunding numbers. Bass, David Zapone has produced a Blu-ray disc like no other, called The Captain's Collection, with two hours of bonus features, including documentaries like For the Love of Spock, plus your favorite Star Trek documentary that you watch over and over again called Chaos on the Bridge with the William Shatner. I do love that one, but you weren't planning on naming all of them, all these documentaries, Roger, there's so many of them. Before we introduce our science officer of the officers here, the lovely Lily Fox Lamb, our co-host. <laughs> thank you, Brian. And thank you, Raj. I can't wait to sit back and enjoy this interview with David Zapone on my nearest view screen. I hear there's a rare interview with Jerry Taylor that's gonna be in the new Voyager documentary. She's really the first woman co-creator of Star Trek that wasn't Roddenberry, uh, Berman, or Pillar, and I'm sure we will have lots of goodies to confirm with David Zapone. Like, is there gonna be a remastered HD Voyager episode footage? I called dibs when asking him that. <sighs> okay, well, I was gonna ask him that too. That's a really good, right? Because they did that in the D Space Nine documentary. Yeah, yeah that's a great one. Him. <laughs> <laughs> great question, with yeah. With all due respect, <laughs> You're off base for talking about a future tense interview. We're talking about this interview. Jerry Taylor also did appear in several mid-1990s documentaries, including Trekkies, Journeys and the Saga of Star Trek The Next Generation, Inside the New Adventure Star Trek Voyager. Oh, Raj, you little dictionary doofus. You're sounding like Next Gen Season 1 Mr. Data again. As Picard once said, Data, don't babble. Raj, don't babble. Wow. I figured it was only a matter of time. Well, we're barely six episodes in. Well, five with you, Lily. And Raj is already butting in at the wrong time with you as well. I'm sorry about that. Well. Raj, we'll talk to you a little bit later after the interview. Computer, close channel. That's, That's okay. okay. <laughs> It's gonna be a blast watching this new Voyager documentary. I know it's not the same as the Deep Space Nine documentary, but wouldn't it be cool if we got a Voyager season eight with say, Echeb joining Starfleet or a Neelix follow-up storyline? But hey, it's fun to imagine. It was, that Deep Space Nine one with Captain Nog was awesome. I'm glad you bring that up, right? Yeah. They have to do something like that, you know? Definitely. It would be amazing to see the future of Voyager if it continued into, say, a new season, like Lily brought up with season eight. Now, we do get to see Janeway briefly as an admiral in Star Trek Nemesis, and now, you know, she's in the new Star Trek Prodigy series coming up, and we know that she's a holographic Starfleet reference in the new upcoming Nickelodeon series, Star Trek Prodigy. That's gonna be awesome, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, plus the money and budget already secured for this Voyager documentary is being used to restore and clean up the footage. You did your research. See, you already had, knew you were going to ask this question, right? About the remastered <laughs> footage. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, do we have a treat for our viewers this week. Coming soon to a view screen near you is the Star Trek Voyager documentary called To the Journey, looking back at Star Trek Voyager. 
And the man behind this highly anticipated documentary is here with us for an exclusive interview. <gasps> we have David Zapone to guide us through this trek. Welcome to A Captain's Log, David. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for uh, kind of rolling with my schedule changes. As I said, we've been in production, and you know how production can be unpredictable. So I greatly appreciate you working with me and my schedule to get this done. And it's a good day because I'm here at my office at Paramount and uh, we're not shooting today and it's relatively quiet. Uh, they're building a, the old Deep Space Nine set across from me. Uh, they're building new sets, so not for Star Trek, just in general. And so it can get a little loud. I apologize if you hear construction. It's a, this is a working movie set. Hey, that's what we like to hear, right? Hollywood in business and working strong, especially at Paramount, the home of the late, Star great Trek. Star Trek. Now, David, I purchased tickets for my daughter and I to see the theatrical release of your Deep Space Nine documentary, oh. What We Left Behind. Seeing Cork, Ron, Bashir, O'Brien's characters for seven seasons and then Dorn for four seasons as Worf. And the other actors let their hair down. It was really, really must-see TV. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Now, it's on Blu-ray, fans. You can see the Deep Space Nine documentary on Blu-ray, as well as The Captains. It's not our TV show, a captain's log. It's called The Captains, and it's another documentary that David Zabone produced. So, David, you've been spinning up this Voyager documentary for us super fans, super Star Trek <laughs> fans. What do you have in store for your upcoming Voyager documentary that you can share with us? You know what I could tell you? We just wrapped uh, two weeks or so of uh, filming in a soundstage. So we built a set. We actually, I think I could leak this. We actually had the set designers from the Orville come over and essentially recreate a holodeck with a captain's chair. So this is the closest thing to a Star Trek set I've ever created and shot on. So it was amazing. And my DP, my director of photography is Jonathan West. Oh, yes. You shot five years of TNG, mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, two years of TNG and five years of Deep Space Nine, as well as what we left behind. So Jonathan graciously agreed to come back. But what we noticed is that there was an incredible outpouring of emotion. And I wasn't necessarily prepared for that because I did not know the Voyager cast as well. I'd really gotten to know the DS9ers because Ira and I had been working on that for five years. So I feel like they're my best friends. I mean, they sometimes can't believe I didn't actually work on the show because I was around it so much. But I think Robert Beltran put it in a good uh, light. He said, you know, we're coming out of COVID and everybody's just so emotionally raw that for a lot of us, this is the first time we've had the opportunity to sit up in, on camera and discuss our recollections 25 years ago. So, yeah, it's becoming uh, very, very emotional, which is something I did not see coming. It's going to be a producers in the making masterpiece, the Voyager documentary. I know our fans are going to win to hear those stories or never, never been heard or told stories to us Absolutely. from that perspective. I guarantee you we have a lot of that already. <laughs> And let me just back up. Yeah, I'm sure mm -hmm. you're going to get to this, but what really saved this film was the cruise, the Star Trek cruise of 2020. You'll recall the 25th anniversary of Voyager was 2020. Mm -hmm. And thanks to the wonderful uh, Lolita Faccio, she was a, she and I have been friends for years. She's a big part of Star Trek and she works with ECP entertainment cruise partners who runs that terrific cruise and they were kind enough to let myself and my crew have run of that ship for eight days and film whatever we wanted. Wow. And sure enough, we get back to port. A day later, the world shuts down. Mm. So we got so lucky that we had, I mean, we were putting in the longest days I have in film, and that's saying a lot, a few 19 to 20 hour days wow. on that ship because there was so much going on. Mm -hmm. You couldn't you couldn't stop. And I wanted to get as much ring, as much value out of that. And I just find that there was a different vibe. The entire ship was Voyager fans, Star Trek fans. So it wasn't like, 
A part of it was Star Trek. A part was just regular guests. All Star Trek. And the actors were happy to be there. I think we all knew we were on the verge of a pandemic. So that played into the mood. So, yeah, this has been a very, very interesting journey. I've never had one quite like this. Then a week after that cruise ended, I get a call from Paramount. We're closing the lot for three months. So totally shut down. So, David, these are your words. I asked if people were interested in seeing a 25th anniversary Star Trek Voyager documentary, and the answer was a resounding yes. Yes is all around here from us and everyone I talked to. This has to be a Star Trek dream for you again and again. Tell us your reaction to the resounding yes for this green light on your Voyager documentary. It's um, a tremendous vote of confidence because I think 455 has now carved out a role for itself and a respect amongst Star Trek fans that they know we not, this is not just a commercial exercise for us. We all love the franchise here. Most certainly me. I'm the one who got this whole ball rolling with Bill Shatner. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, again, a vote of confidence. Like, hey, these are the guys that did what we left behind. These are the guys that did for the love of Spock. These are the guys that did chaos on the bridge. These are the guys that did the captains. These are the guys that did the captains close-ups. I mean, I can go on. So these are guys, or our team, I should say, that take Star Trek seriously and are not looking just to regurgitate the episodes because we can all see what's on the episodes. We can all watch the show. What we're trying to do is get inside the, the heads of the actors themselves and what the experience was truly like and how has it changed people's lives? How has it changed the fans' lives? Um, I'm probably going to be going to the European Space Center uh, to interview a lot of people. NASA has offered. I've done a lot of stuff with NASA over the years. Wow. So, um, yeah, I think uh, that it was, again, a vote of confidence. Okay, it's these guys. I'm going to donate. Now, did I think that we would double <laughs> Deep Space Nine? <laughs> Not for a second. We were thinking maybe two thirds or maybe a third more. But uh, I think we just did a very, very good job of messaging this time. So now we have two successful. I have Voyager is the most successfully funded, crowdfunded documentary in history. Like number two and five are what we left behind for the love of Spock or something like that. Somewhere in the top five. So we've got a pretty good track record. We're just getting started and heading for Warp Factor 9 in our interview. The dampening field is on, so no need to even try to communicate or do anything else. Stay here. And coming up, we're discussing the fascinating aspects of Star Trek Voyager's upcoming documentary, To the Journey, looking back at Star Trek Voyager with David Zappone. A captain's log with special guest David Zappone returns in a moment. We're discussing the upcoming documentary officially titled To the Journey, looking back at Star Trek Voyager. Well, 455 films broke their previous crowdfunding record with an outpouring of film support for your Star Trek Deep Space Nine documentary, What We Left Behind. Why? Because Star Trek fans are the greatest fans, of course. Wait, there's more. So, David, this production company you have at the top of your documentaries, called 455 Films, has set a new record for the most successful crowdfunding campaign for a documentary film in history. The campaign raised nearly $1.3 million with contributions from almost 12,000 fans. What does that mean to you to have that record-breaking support? Well, first of all, it's a testament to the fans, isn't it? I mean, it shows Voyager sometimes... Uh, doesn't get its due in the pantheon of Star Trek shows. And I think this kind of puts that to rest. Uh, I don't think you have 1.3 million in donations if this were not a beloved show. So I would say that that's uh, number one. But when you step back the reality of, uh, reality of it, however, you always have to keep in mind that that's a great number. But a big percentage of that goes right off the top to Indiegogo goes off the top to the create, uh, credit card companies. And then we have to actually now manufacture and fulfill all of these orders. Now, there are a lot of experiential things like people want to go to Vasquez Rocks or Starfleet Command. So that's great. That's just time. But screenings in, in New York and London, we'll have to rent theaters. We'll have to get 
talent there. Uh, the T-shirts need to be manufactured and shipped. The most pro- probably the most popular item was the uh, Captain Janeway coffee mug. I think we're manufacturing three thousand of them. And that's the actual one that was used in Voyager. We've gone back to the exact <laughs> uh, manufacturer. That's okay. And it's going to be. We're getting some tests, so we don't have them yet. But uh, Paul Camuso is uh, headlining that uh, effort. And he is making sure it is screen correct right down to the rivets on the handle. It's so awesome. We all know Star Trek fans. And rightly so. They're, they're exacting and demanding. So, uh, yeah, there's a, you know, so yes, that's a great number. But a big chunk of that goes to uh, fulfillment. So it's not all for the film, unfortunately. Well, I know our fans are grateful because there's coffee in that nebula, is what Janeway yeah, would say. <laughs> there's coffee in that nebula. Yes, indeed. In fact, these masterful producers should be recognized. David Zappone is joined again by several producers from other successful Star Trek documentaries. There are some names that you've seen on screen like Joe Cornbrot and Kevin Lane, among many other gifted people who bring us back to our beloved Star Trek series, in documentary form. And by the way, Chaos on the Bridge, favorite documentary ever. Oh, Absolutely you, loved it. Absolutely. It's so in depth uh, with the next generation and then interviews and people that you don't even get to see very often, like Diana Moldar. That's the beauty of Bill Shatner. You know, I pitched him that idea after we'd done The Captain so successfully. Then mm-hmm. we did another one called Get a Life. And I said, Bill, we were out, he was riding horses. I was out at the, the stables. And I said, what about the next generation? There's really a good story there. Nah, I don't want to do it. And then he thought about it a little bit, and I brought up the idea to him again. And he said, you know what? Let's dive in. Let me have a talk with Rick Berman. And so he and Rick went out to lunch, and Bill recorded, the, with Rick's permission, the conversation. And Bill said, holy moly, there's a story here. And what Bill, why Bill is so brilliant in that documentary, he's directing, but he stays out of the way in the narrative. Sometimes people accuse Shatner of kind of taking over all of the narrative and taking the air out of the room. Not so if you watch Chaos on the Bridge. Very few times, only when people call him out on like, well, Bill, what did you think when you did it? It He really allows the people to tell their stories. And we painstakingly balance the narrative because we did not want to trash anybody, uh, maybe with the exception of Leonard Maisel, who did not come out <laughs> to uh, Gene's former attorney. But we really wanted to present Gene as just a brilliant, flawed, as we all are, man. Mm-hmm. And then the ultimate story, it's one of redemption. I mean, the, the show goes on to incredible heights. The main complaint I get about chaos, and this is thanks to to the Canadian government who funded it, is that it's not longer. It really should be a feature, a 90 rather than a 58 minute documentary, which is one of the reasons why we put the special features here on blatant uh, uh, product placement. This is the Captain's Collection Blu-ray, which includes the first time uh, chaos has been on Blu-ray actually, and also all the great special features. The other, um, probably the most important thing for me to come out of chaos is the friendship with Maury Hurley. Maurice oh, Hurley. That was exactly on the tip of my tongue. Maurice Hurley. I was going to ask Maury about Maury was a true Hollywood producer, tough guy, guy mm-hmm. grew up in the streets, but cared about his work had never done one interview, I think, for the first season of TNG, but mm-hmm. never went on camera again, left after season two, right. and agreed to go on camera for us because he was friends with Bill. Oh, he and cool. Bill did a show together. So then Maury ended up coming over to Bill's house for dinners, and I get cornered. You know, what, what are you doing with the, the, the cut? What's it look like? And Maury was 6'3". Oh, wow. A, you know, an older guy at the time, but still intimidating. So I'm like, humming, humming, humming. <laughs> but he came up with the whole wacky doodle idea and that whole fun wacky doodle music in there. That's all Maury. That's really cool. 
Yeah, so that was a, a great joy for me to have that honor to meet Moriarty. I enjoyed that too. He was a real big part of season two of Next Generation. Yeah, we we'll definitely get um, the captain's collection because there's a lot more of his interview. It's all in there. Oh, I'll be watching for sure. And, and you know where we shot that. Another nice thing. Oh, tell me if I'm rocking too much. I have a tendency. To, I know. I they told me switch your chair so you can't rock. Um, we shot that at the control room of JPL two weeks before the Curiosity's landing. Oh, wow. Really? Bill and I were sitting in his office. I'm like, where should we go? I'm like, well, Bill, NASA loves you. We're 10 minutes away from uh, La Cunada. Let's go up to JPL. And sure enough, they opened the entire, because they're such Star Trek fans. It's amazing. So we got to shoot in the control room. I'm going to talk about a dream coming true. That is a dream come true and, and great story there. 455 Films is an award-winning production company based nearby in Hollywood, California, LA. They are currently producing a documentary about the Star Trek Voyager fandom, its 25th anniversary, and well, everything else more that you'd want from a documentary. It's called To The Journey, looking back at Star Trek Voyager. Stay tuned for our next episode here on A Captain's Log, where we'll have the second part of our interview with producer-director David Zappone. Much more to talk about and discuss with him on the Star Trek Voyager documentary. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. Back to this week, David Zappone was really giving us some great insight into the Voyager documentary. He really was. That, that was a really good interview. Yeah, it was great to find out, you know, what we have to look forward to. And it was really amazing coming from his Paramount office in Hollywood. <laughs> Just a mountain or two between us and Hollywood here at the studio, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Lily. What a treat we had with David Zappone this week. Now, let's check if Raj is down in the shuttle bay, perhaps somewhere on the ship, and he can rejoin us. Ambassador Kreutz to Raj. Raj here. Great interview, Ambassador Brian and Lily. You did technobabble often with your Trek word and technical knowledge, especially on all the things Star Trek related. Raj, yes, you did pick up on that technobabble, and I trust you enjoyed the definitively long-winded explanations of Trek-minded tech and fandom. I enjoyed the Trek-babble. I made that word up. Can't, Can't wait, wait to, to hear, hear more trek -na babbling from you, Bass, and all the solid trek know how knowledge from David in part two of your David Zappone interview, straight from Star Trek's home at Paramount next week. Oh, Raj, our half-hour episode would be a one-hour special if you put your two cents in there. Let's get to Trexcellence. Yes, of course, Lily. Well, just like when Scotty tells Kirk, I'm giving you all she's got, Captain! You may feel like your brain knows the answer, but you just can't quite get there, right? Mm -hmm. Answer it right, and well, you should reward yourself with a Deanna Troy double chocolate delight from your food replicator, or in the 21st century, I guess it'd be a 3D printer. Ooh, yum. I'll definitely be having that for dessert after I get this question right. Let's hear the sound bite. Listen up, viewers. Commander. Destroy this vessel. I gave you Let's a direct back. command. Go! Helmsman, flank speed. Weapons officer, stand by to fire main batteries as soon as we reach optimum range. This is where you, the excellent Star Trek fan, know what you just heard. Number one, Romulan commander yells to sub-commander Tall from the bridge of the Enterprise. Number two, Romulan sub-commander Tarul, assigned to the USS Defiant to operate and guard a cloaking device, yells, Attack! That was played by Martha Hackett, actually. That oh. Romulan, yeah, who plays Suska. Interesting. I love when they get to play multiple characters. Yeah, and different. it's really cool. Romulan officer Navala brought an injured Romulan to the ship's sick bay and encountered the doctor interrogating him. Old school Romulans, I always thought they made very intriguing enemies with their clever smarts, you know, and- Bach would say illogical. Stay tuned for our second part with the David Zappone interview here on A Captain's Log. You won't want to miss it next week. Part two. Manifested yourself into a human I can depend on to bring me happy. 